The first responsibility of the master is for the safety of the lives of his officers and crew. The second is the safety of the ship and its cargo. His third responsibility is to safeguard the environment. The consequences of an oil spill can be enormous. As part of the pollution prevention framework of MARPOL, every ship greater than 400 gross tons and every oil tanker larger than 150 gross tons is required to have a shipboard oil pollution emergency plan, a SOPEP. This will govern the response to oil and bunker spills worldwide except for tankers in United States waters. This video demonstrates the use of this plan. MARPOL prohibits any discharge of oil other than very small quantities under carefully controlled conditions. Everything possible must be done to avoid a spill. Most spills are small, less than seven tons or 50 barrels. Most of these occur during routine cargo operations and bunkering. These are controlled events, so with good planning and strict adherence to proper procedures, spills can be kept to a minimum. Should there be an equipment failure, Minimizing the spill will depend on a rapid response from the deck watch and good communication. The first step in bunkering is a written plan. A bunkering operation should be treated with the same care as a cargo operation. Follow the procedures and checklists set out in your ship's manuals. All officers and crew who will be involved must be briefed and have access to the plan. The piping system must be correctly lined up and all bunker system valves and connections not required must be closed. If there are any sea or overboard valves connected to the bunker system, they must be closed and lashed. The ship should ensure that the barge personnel have checked the hoses to ensure they are in good condition. All scuppers must be plugged and drip trays be in place below all connections and air vents. The vents must be opened so that the displaced air can escape freely. Absorbent materials and portable pumps must be made ready. If this equipment is already on deck to safeguard cargo operations, some of it may need to be moved. Before bunkering begins, there must be a meeting between the ship's staff and the bunker barge staff. The bunkering plan must be discussed. The units of measurement and rates of flow must be understood by everybody. There needs to be agreement about procedures for both emergency shutting down and topping off. And there must be complete agreement over communications. The checklist must be discussed and signed off. Only once everything is agreed and the ship has checked the bunker tanks can the connections be made and checked. When everything is secure, bunkering can begin. Pipe connected, bulb open, ready to receive bunker, sir. Thank you, Bosun. Arabia, Chief Engineer, the bridge, we are ready to start bunkering. The officer in charge gives the order to commence once he's certain that all the valves to the designated tanks are open. The transfer must start at a low flow rate. Everyone must be aware that things can go wrong at any time. They need to have an action plan ready to cope with the worst possibility. A vigilant deck watch is essential. There must be continual checking of all pipework and air vents for oil leaks. Transfer rates will need to be carefully monitored and kept to the figures set out in the plan to ensure there is no overpressurization of tanks. Communication between ship and bunker operators should be continuous preferably by visual, Oil voice and radio contact. Communications are vital. Most bunkering spills are caused, or made worse, by a failure in the communications between the ship and the bunkering personnel. Ample ullage space must be left for draining the hoses. Everyone must keep alert and be ready to stop the procedure immediately if there is any sign of a leak. The quicker the pressure is reduced, the smaller the spill. Transfer operations during rain require extra monitoring of the deck containment system. With scuppers plugged, the deck can fill with water, enabling any spillage to overflow quickly over the side. Watch this tank now, 101, that's coming up. 
Should there be a bunker spill, or likelihood of a spill, the SOPEP will come into action and possibly the terminal's response plan. Every effort must be made to contain the oil on the ship. The plan will list specific tasks for many. Others, including anyone who can be spared from the engineering department, should go on deck to help. In an uneventful bunkering operation, once topping off is complete, the disconnection procedure can begin. All hoses must be drained before disconnection, and all bunker system connections must be blank flanged as soon as the hose is disconnected. All fuel lines and tank filling valves must be securely closed. Final alloging should be done to confirm the quantity received and that ample space has been left for expansion. Good planning, thorough checking of equipment and keeping to the correct procedures will reduce the chance of an operational spill in both bunkering and cargo operations. Everything seems to be the pre-loading. However, ship's officers all need to be fully conversant with their ship's response plan. The Marpol SOPEP will have five sections. General information about the ship, a list of reporting requirements in the event of a spill, steps to be taken to control any discharge of oil, a list of national and local coordination centres, together with procedures for coordinating response actions with shore-based organisations, and lastly, additional information about training and review procedures and other topics. This information may not be set out in five distinct sections in your ship's SOPEP, but all the details will be there, as well as a great deal of more specific information about each topic. The plan will be an action checklist. It's specific to each ship and includes the list of mandatory notifications which must be made in case of a spill, or even if a spill is likely. Regular exercising of the plan is effectively mandatory. These exercises will sometimes be organised by head office, but more generally by the master. It's important that each exercise is planned with a specific training objective. In this instance, it's been decided to exercise the communications between the ship and shore in response to a serious incident, a grounding. This ship is an oil tanker, but a similar exercise simulating a bunker spill after a grounding would be useful for any ship with a Marpole SOPEP. The master plans the exercise scenario well in advance with the help of his chief officer. As the exercise will be carried out while the ship is at anchor, this includes preparing a chart of the ship's position at the time of the hypothetical incident. Tide and weather conditions are also decided. To keep the exercise vigorous, it's important to work out a different, realistic and interesting scenario each time. As the exercise is primarily a communications exercise, the master informs his marine superintendent of when it's likely to start. I understand that you will start the exercise in about five minutes. They agree a mutually acceptable time. Neither of them informs his staff of his intentions. At an appropriate moment in the ship's operations, the master starts the exercise. Start up from the drill that we're having this morning. We'd like to have a look at that while I speak to the engine room. How much realism is possible will depend on the ship's operations. The master begins by informing the engine room. In a real grounding, the master would instruct the engine room to stop the engine. In a genuine emergency, it would be necessary to stop the air supply fans. This is to avoid the risk of flammable vapours from any oil discharge reaching the engine room and accommodation spaces. Depending on the circumstances, oil could get in through seawater intakes. In this instance, the ship is at anchor. The main engines are not running, and there is little to be gained by stopping the air supply fans or closing the seawater intakes. Mate, Captain. Yeah, good morning. We're going to start the drill that we discussed yesterday. The scenario in an emergency, one of the first steps would be to muster the crew. In this exercise, the master informs only those who need to know. As the objective is primarily to test communications, only the key players are mustered. The master and another officer will remain on the bridge. The emergency party, who in a real incident would probably be on deck, will be in the cargo control room. Another officer, 
who will represent the Coast Guard, establishes himself in a cabin. He also has a chart of the sea area of the simulated grounding. For reference, the master gets out the oil pollution emergency plan. Hello, second. Hello, third mate. Yes, sir. Captain has decided to have a drill today. It's regarding oil pollution. From the ship's cargo control room, the emergency party will notify the master of the exercise events on deck. Generally, it's the chief officer who is in charge. Mate, Captain. Come in, sir. Can you give me your preliminary report on... The master uses his walkie-talkie to communicate with him. Uh, well, on deck I could find out that the oil level in number three starboard tank is... According to the incident scenario, oil can be seen on the water by the starboard bow. At least one tank has been ruptured. Injured, and what is your general assessment of the ship situation? Well, there's no casualty at present, and I don't think there's any obvious danger at present. The master begins the initial notification of the shore-based organizations, starting with the nearest coastal state, represented by the officer seen earlier. Alpha 3, this is Milford Coast Guard. What's the name of your ship, please? Notification of the coastal state is mandatory under MARPOL if there's an actual or yes, probable sir, discharge of oil. The authorities will want accurate and up-to-date information to enable them to mount their own response. Charlie 6 Kilo Alpha 3, this is Milford Coast Guard. Your message received, understood. Next to be notified are the operators or owners. With both Hello. them and the coastal authorities, the master sets up a schedule of communications. In this way, everyone knows when they'll get an information update. I understand that you are aground, and the number three tank is definitely ruptured. I'll get back to you. It is probably best for the master to stay on the bridge okay. throughout the exercise, okay. as that's right. where he would need to be during any incident. Right, second mate. What's the it's from there that he can most effectively turn. coordinate well, the activities of everyone involved in the response. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mate, Captain? Right, there. right, can you give me the latest update on deck? Yes, sir. After checking, I find that there is to get information about the events on deck, he talks to the chief officer. Yes, um, what about soundings around the ship? I have sounded the areas around the ship and it appears that the vessel is around, around number three staff. Checked and found that there is no water coming into any of the ballast tanks and also the engine room confirms that there is no loss of fuel oil from the fuel oil tanks nor is any water coming into the tanks. It's from the bridge that the master can best talk to the shore-based authorities when he needs to. Would it be possible to... The safety of his crew and his ship will always be his prime concern. Into the empty tank, do you think? Uh, well, the chief officer informs him that soundings indicate that only a small portion of the ship's bottom is in contact with the seabed. Alleging indicates that the starboard number three wing tank has leaked a substantial quantity of heavy fuel oil. It's possible that a second tank is leaking slowly. So we're only aground around uh, starboard side forward of number three? That's right. Now that the type and quantity of oil spilt is known, the master notifies the coastal state and the owner of the precise details of the incident. The plan will have a contact list as well as a list of the information that will be required. Many of the items are obvious, but under the stress of an emergency, even the obvious can be forgotten. Detailed notification is also extended to the other interested parties, such as the P&I Club, who may mobilize experts to the scene. Good communications are vital in any response to a spill, and this doesn't just mean those on the ship. Those on shore have an important role to play in helping those at sea. They'll have their own plan, which will be integrated with the ship's plan. They can take much of the burden of notification from the master, as well as organizing the cleanup operation. The damage must be from frame 71. Both the team on shore and those on the bridge should keep a timed record of the information they receive and their decisions and commands. This information will be very important should there be any legal proceedings afterwards.
Charts with any notes or plots, as well as cargo arrangements and other relevant yeah. paperwork, must all be kept. Well, we know we are ground right from number three tank forward. Of the SOPEP will list a number of possible methods of reducing pollution. These will include transferring the cargo between tanks, lightering, and so on. These arrangements would also be applicable to a bunker spill. Permission will need to be given by the shore authorities for any procedure that involves transferring cargo or moving the ship. In the after but there's sufficient space, there's sufficient there, space there so that we can transfer the uh, fluid of both tanks into one That's tank. That's right, it's an empty yeah. tank. Okay. Will you look into the possibility, see if we can transfer cargo from... If everyone on board is safe, then reducing the quantity of oil reaching the environment has the highest priority. In this scenario, there's a slow leak from a second tank. If the oil from this tank, as well as the oil remaining in the ruptured tank after equilibrium has been reached, can be transferred, the amount of pollution will be reduced. However, a grounding or any damage to the hull will affect the structural stresses on the ship and will invalidate the ship's loading computer. This will make it impossible for those on board to evaluate accurately the consequences of any transfer of cargo or bunkers. Got the figures for his right. We can transfer about 200 tons each. From two the master will need advice from his shore office as only they will have the expertise and data necessary to make a reliable assessment, sometimes by using an outside stability consultant. To make some calculation on the stresses and forces and the Yeah, well, uh, of course we will do that. But on, on the face of it, it seems that the ship was fully loaded and uh, two times... This technical assistance is one of the many things that the shore office can do to help those on the stricken ship. The shore team should regard themselves as an integral part of the ship's oil spill response. Media and press interest is liable to be intense. One person in the shore office should be responsible for dealing with this. This is the holding statement which we will issue to the press. If you could type that out for me, please. Press briefings should be regular and as full and accurate as the circumstances allow. Never speculate. Keep to the facts. If information is not fed to the press, they are liable to draw their own conclusions. We will issue a press statement. Yes, Coast Guard, Charlie 6 Kilo Alpha 3. I have an update report on the message of uh, an hour ago. I can confirm that we, the vessel is aground and the draft has been reduced by approximately one meter. So we are one meter aground forward. And at the moment, we have lost approximately 120 cubic meters of fuel oil. By now, a clean-up contractor would be underway to contain the pollution. The coastal state authorities are kept up to date on what's happening on the ship. Right, I think that's the, their answer. 200 tons from each of those tanks into six centre. Um, and you reckon the half metre change in trim? That's right. OK. That's Transferring the cargo, in this case, or indeed bunkers, from a leaking tank would reduce the risk of further pollution. But is this practical without endangering the ship? Captain of the Francis, can I speak to the Marine Superintendent again, please? Thanks. The operator's office is now asked whether it would be safe to transfer the cargo. And they will speak to you soon. The naval architect who has been called in to assist in the exercise examines the problem. Yep. You that doing this will not endanger the ship. So you may go ahead with the transfer. As only a small like part of the ship's them, bottom is right. aground, the indications are that it would be safe okay. to proceed. Right, this will entail That's mixing right. some cargoes. About, uh, 20 minutes, half an hour. In these circumstances, cargo quality concerns are secondary. It's far better to reduce the risk of pollution. Yep. So about 20 minutes before you're ready to start uh, moving the cargo. Get right to it. Right, second mate, uh, what's the tide doing now? Okay, Captain. Let's see. Examination of the exercise charts shows the ship aground on a sandy seabed with rock outcrops. Tidal considerations indicate it's likely that the ship will float off on the high tide expected in four hours. I reckon we should be finished For reasons of safety, it's decided to have tugs in attendance. Yes. 
Okay, that's fine. This situation is discussed with the operator. As the ship is not in peril, it's decided that the operator will organize the tugs. All goes well. Okay, so tugs will arrive in about one hour's time. That's fine. I calculate that we sh would be floating off in about two hours time. Call me back before then. Please, Captain. Okay, bye-bye. The coastal state is kept informed of what the ship intends to do. Francis, Charlie 6, Kilo Alpha 3. Charlie 6, Kilo Alpha 3, this is Milford Coast Guard. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. In a real incident, they have the legal authority to restrict the ship's movements. And they are arranging tugs and would anticipate that the vessel will float off with assistance. The master decides to finish the exercise as its main objectives have been achieved. The ship returns to her normal operational footing. Yes, second. Captain here, just phoning up to say that we have now completed this morning's exercise. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Captain of the Francis. Uh, can I speak to the super again, please? Hello again, Captain. Just phoning up to say that we've now completed the exercise. I think it's gone very well. And, of course, I'll be sending in a re full report uh, with any recommendations. You should get that in the next two or three days. OK, bye-bye. Soon afterwards, there's a formal debriefing. All aspects of the response are analysed. I think the time of the exercise, the time the scale that we looked at, was about four hours. It poses its own particular problem, which I don't think, which I don't think anybody in the world has seriously considered. You can learn from it. Let's face it. Most of us hope, well, we all hope, that we will never go ground, we'll never be in collision, we'll never have oil spills, we won't have accidents. Even after grounding also when ship is... Cargo and bunker spills are not common, but they still occur in spite of every effort to prevent them. The objective of the MARPOL Convention is to eliminate marine oil pollution. To this end, ships are required to have an international oil pollution certificate and ships above a defined size are required to have an oil record book and a ship's oil pollution emergency plan, a SOPEP. There is no substitute for good training. That's why it's so important to exercise the SOPEP. Regular exercises are effectively mandatory. They ensure that everyone is familiar with the plan. Exercises also provide an excellent opportunity to examine the plan to confirm that it's practical and effective. Exercises should be logged and available for inspection as evidence by port state control inspectors. These exercises will become as familiar to ship's officers and crew as lifeboat and fire drills, whether their ship's cargo is oil or not. Oil spills can have serious consequences for the environment the ship's operator, the cargo owner, and the seafarer. So make sure that you are prepared to respond quickly and efficiently to minimize the effects of any spill.